We uh, began uh, two weeks ago. We began our our little series, two part series on defending the faith, and um, uh, began to talk about in the beginning uh, some of the good things that are happening throughout the world, but also the need to defend the faith. And we're going to complete that uh, today, tonight. And I would just want to look at um, a few things, but let's open in prayer. And if you don't mind, I'll open in prayer and then we'll get into the subject. Our God and Father, we thank you for this time tonight. We thank you for the subject of defending the faith. And Father, may we be faithful to your word, faithful to your truth, Father, and that uh, we would stand on that and we would defend, fight, and defend, and argue, Father, for what we find in the words of Scripture. And so, Father, we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our previous time, we talked about some of the changes that are taking place, uh, changes in, in Bible colleges, um, changes in different ministries, changes in between age groups, those in the, the millennial age group, that they think differently than we do, and are not everyone, of course, in that age group, but a lot of people in that age group uh, think differently. They think that if uh, we looked at a, 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 a uh, sorry, we looked at this particular slide, and we saw that 47% of millennials think it's wrong to share Christ with someone of a different uh, religion in the hope that they will come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see the challenges before us, and, uh, and we see there's a great need to defend the faith. And the, there's a number of different doctrines that we really need to defend. Uh, we need to defend all of Scripture, but I want to highlight a number of doctrines that we need to defend. We're going to look at a large number, and then we're going to narrow that down to just a couple, and we're going to zero in on a few doctrines that are very, very important. First of all, we need to defend, of course, the centrality of the Lord Jesus, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw that today, among evangelicals, is a high percentage that don't believe in the deity of the Lord Jesus. They believe the Lord Jesus, a high percentage, believe that he's a created being, um, and that the, that, that the Holy Spirit is a, is a force. So we need to proclaim the deity of the Lord Jesus. I wonder when the last time, uh, you know, Bethany Bible Chapel or other chapels um, have taught on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things we're doing in our local assembly, and uh, on the back of our bulletin, and maybe on the back of your bulletin as well, you have a statement of faith. And we are, Sunday mornings, we're preaching through the statement of faith, the things we believe. And of course, one of the first things is the deity of the Lord Jesus, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I encourage you to do that. I encourage many assemblies to do that, uh, defend the, the strengths, the centrality of the Lord Jesus Christ, centrality in worship, uh, centrality, authority of the Lord Jesus Christ over the local assembly the centrality of the cross and salvation, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the atonement uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the unlimited atonement, the um, evangelism, gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, what, is the, what are the components of the gospel, what are components of saving faith, uh, missions, all of these different kinds of aspects that have to do with uh, the uh, centrality of the cross and of the centrality of salvation. The centrality of the local church to be able to teach through and defend and, and uh, make clear uh, the headship of Christ and the eldership with the local church and the Lord's Supper and spiritual gifts and uh, baptism and all, all of these different aspects of uh, the local church. These are important to teach and uh, and make known. We have uh, recently, we have a dear sister. She is from a Baptist background, and uh, she has been coming. Uh, she's from Alabama. Her son lives in our area, 
and she found us on the internet and she started coming. She's come every Sunday since for the last five or six Sundays. And this past Sunday, I noticed she was wearing a head covering and, uh, and we've given her a Bible, a large print Bible, a little larger print. And we've talked to her. Uh, she saw the head coverings. We talked to her about that. And it, it's just, it's just refreshing to see someone uh, to be explained something in scripture and to obey that, uh, you know, the following week. And so it's encouraging. The centrality in the, in the uh, local church, the headship of Christ, the centrality of the Lord's coming, the rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture of Christ, um, the kingdom reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, all the different aspects of prophecy, uh, one of the reasons I'd like to say that prophecy is so important is that prophecy always puts the Lord Jesus Christ first. Have you ever noticed that? In the rapture, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is first. He comes for his church. He is in the first place. In the kingdom reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one, the, the one who was rejected in Jerusalem come back, comes back to rule and reign uh, for a thousand years on the throne of David in Jerusalem. Uh, he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords for those thousand of years. He is in the first place. When we teach about the, uh, the truth about the judgment seat of Christ, he again is in the first place. When we talk about the judgments in the tribulation period, again, the Lord Jesus Christ is in the first place. Uh, when we talk about the judgments, the Lord is in the first place. And so we see this over and over again. Uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, the rapture and, and different, uh, different events of prophecy are so important. It puts the Lord Jesus Christ in the first place. It honors the promises of God. It honors the teaching of, of Scripture. And so one of the areas that we need to, def we need to defend is the centrality of the Lord Jesus Christ coming for the church and then coming to rule and reign on the earth. Again, the, 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 cent the centrality of the word of God, that we believe in a plenary uh, verbal uh, inspiration of scripture. Plenary means every word or, or every, verbal means every word. So we believe in every word inspired scripture. And um, we need to stress that and teach that. And I think that's one of the things we do very well in local assemblies because we lay out to people why they often say, why do we do the things that we do? Why do we have a weekly Lord's Supper? Why do the ladies have a head covering? Why, why all these different things? Why no pastor? Why do you have a weekly Lord's Supper? All these things. And we say, because the word of God teaches it. We say, because we stand, if the word of God teaches it, we want to practice that. And, um, and so that's a very good thing, to teach and preach the whole counsel of God. The Apostle Paul says that in, in Acts chapter 20, that he says he preaches the whole counsel of God, and we need to do that. Teach the New Testament scriptures, teach the Old Testament passages as well, teach the great doctrines of scripture, the great passages of scripture and uh, the centrality of the word of God. But here's some doctrines themselves that we should be teaching. The deity of Christ, salvation by grace alone through faith and not by works. Um, very, very important. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is the gift of God. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is a gift of God. That gift points back to the salvation we have through grace, uh, by grace, and through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Divine creation, this is something that's being under attack today, and I think it's good to be able to teach this doctrine and uh, to show videos, if you can, on the teaching that of divine creation by God, not evolution, not half creation by God and half evolution, uh, not some middle ground, but that we teach biblical creation that we find in the word of God. Eternal security, 
the holiness of God. It's very, very important. The, um, the God will judge sin one day. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the, the just. He came and died the just for the unjust. And we need to teach the sinlessness of the Lord Jesus, the deity, the impeccability of the Lord Jesus, the holiness of God. These are all very, very important. In the importance of heaven and hell. These are under attack. They have always been under attack. They're unpopular doctrines. And we need to speak about them and talk about them. It's easy to talk about heaven. It's harder to talk about hell. And uh, we, need to, we need to speak about that, eternal punishment. The, one of the most favorite, uh, among, uh, one of the most favorite verses among believers is John 3.16. And in John 6, 3, 6, uh, John 3.16, we have the teaching about Christ as our Savior. We have the teaching about the Father sending the Son. We have the teaching about salvation by faith. But we have the teaching of eternal punishment, of judgment and hell for those who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these are important doctrines. The importance of the, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a very, very important doctrine, and I think we need to teach this as well. We need to teach the authority of Scripture. We've just spoke about that. Uh, we need to teach about worship and the Lord's Supper. And... Um, we need to teach about marriage. This has been under attack like no other doctrine. Uh, very, very important that we teach this doctrine. Uh, we need to teach uh, dispensationalism, and we'll look at that a little bit later. This, this tremendous and very important method of hermeneutics, we need a method of interpreting scripture. We need to teach those. The person and work of the Holy Spirit, uh, aggressive evangelism. We need to get back to aggressive evangelism, and we'll look at that a little bit later this evening. The doctrine of the gospel. What is the gospel? What are, uh, when we speak about the gospel, what is it? Uh, what role does faith have? What role does the gospel have? What role does the death, what, what role does grace have? What role does um, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross have? What role does repentance have? All of these areas uh, go into the doctrine of the gospel. And then, of course, a worldwide missionary effort. Assemblies are, are, are traditionally, uh, and for a very long time, been very good in this. And we need to keep that worldwide missionary effort. And uh, I know some assemblies, and some have come and spoken to me, where they hardly ever give to missions. They hardly uh, pray for missionaries. And um, they just, it's just fallen aside in certain assemblies. And we need to keep the uh, keep that effort and keep that uh, that truth of a worldwide missionary effort uh, at the forefront of our thoughts and minds. You know, it's a wonderful thing that an assembly in Land Lakes, Florida, or in Yonkers, New York, uh, can can give money to a mission field, and those Bibles or those missionaries or that effort, wherever those funds go to, uh, can reach can reach unsaved people in different parts of the world. That's just a wonderful, wonderful truth. And uh, we need to be involved in missionary efforts local, uh, evangelistic efforts local, and missionary efforts worldwide. Just recently, our local assembly funded uh, a deaf school and local assembly and, um, in Fiji, uh, off the coast of New Zealand. Uh, wonderful work that was started in the 1960s. Uh, one of the few schools in that area for deaf, for deaf children uh, goes all the way through high school. And uh, there are many, many that have gone through that school. They have an assembly of 100 people. Uh, all, uh, I think 80% are deaf, the other 20% no sign language. All the messages, all the teaching is done in sign language. So it's tremendous. All the children who come are put up, are housed, are fed, are taken care of all the time that they are there uh, at, that, at that school. Uh, deaf students come from Australia, New Zealand, uh, the Solomon Islands, and it, it's just a great ministry. And it's great to be able to support that kind of ministry, as well as many other kinds of ministries worldwide. And then uh, number 16, the rapture of the church and prophetic teaching. Well, let's go on. There's three 
areas that I want to look at tonight. Three areas that I think are very, very important. And if these, if these areas are compromised on, I think it affects, I think it negatively affects the local assembly. And I want to begin with looking at dispensationalism, and then we'll look at the gospel, and then we'll look at briefly at the non-Calvinistic view of salvation. And uh, so let's take a look at some of these things. First of all, hope you have your Bible handy because we will uh, have to be looking and turning uh, to some passages of Scripture. First of all, why dispensationalism? And I'd like to say that without, without dispensationalism, we cannot understand our Bibles. Without dispensationalism, we can't explain some of the great questions in Scripture. For instance, should we have state churches? In Germany, in Norway, in Italy, there are state churches. Some of the people in these countries, some of the Christians would say, well, if we go back to the Old Testament, we see there was a nation in a, in, in, in a part of a country, uh, the Jewish nation in Israel. They were, they were a state, and they had, they had Judaism as their religion. And they say, we get this teaching from the Old Testament. Should there be state churches today? How would you explain that? Without dispensationalism, I don't think we're able to explain that. If we say there's no difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, if there's not a, a different way of working, a, a different way that God has worked, then we have a, a problem as far as state churches. What about church armies? You know, there were church armies during the Reformation. One of the great reformers, uh, Ehrlich Swingley, a Swiss reformer, he died in battle. He died in battle fighting against other forces. What about religious cities? Jerusalem and Rome and uh, what about, should we have religious, great religious cities? Now we don't have these right now, but there are some Christians that would argue we should have these. The Catholic church would argue we should have these. The Lutheran Church would argue we should have state churches and state uh, and, and and religious cities. And how would we how would we explain that? How would we defend Scripture? What a polygamy! That was in the Old Testament. We don't see a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. How would we argue against polygamy? Should it be practiced today? You know, there are some Christians that practice polygamy. It's hard to believe that evangelical Christians, not a large number, granted, very small percentage, but some of them say it was in the Old Testament, why can't we do that today? And so dispensationalism speaks to all these issues. If someone would come to you and say, why shouldn't, shouldn't we do these practices, what biblical answer could we give them? And I think this is a very, very important thing. That's why dispensationalism is so important. There are Christians that look at the Bible as there's no difference between the letters of the Apostle Paul and the early, the early books of the Old Testament. There's no difference between the book of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and 1 Kings and 2 Kings and what we have in the literature uh, that Paul wrote to the church. There's no difference between Israel and the church. They're just a continuation of the same. And so dispensationalism speaks to these issues. And without a firm understanding of dispensationalism, we will have a lot of confusion in our, in, in our local churches. And I think today there is confusion, partly because there's a lack of understanding about dispensationalism. Well, what is a definition? of dispensationalism. Um, let me give you this definition. This is a definition I put together based upon a number of different uh, definitions that I found, and I put them together in one. Dispensationalism shows Christ to be the center of God's program for the ages and the object of worship for eternity. Dispensationalism shows the failure of man, the mercy of God, the glory of Christ as both Savior and King. 
dispensational has proven itself to be a stimulus for evangelism, for world missions. It is a sound principle for Bible interpretation. It, is, it shows the importance of Bible prophecy, and it shows the centrality of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for all of these reasons, dispensationalism is very, very important. Let's see what happened. Here we go. Sorry. This is a, a uh, statement by Charles Ryrie uh, on prophecy, dispensational and prophecy. And I think it's very good. For the believer, the knowledge of prophecy provides joy in the midst of affliction cleanses and encourages holy living, gives the proof of the reliability of holy scripture. It gives facts about life and death. It provides truth about the end of history. Prophecy draws our hearts out in worship to a God who is in complete control, who will accomplish his will in history. To slight prophecy is to slight these benefits. It's also, dispensationalism is also a safeguard against liberalism. There are those who do not follow, do not follow a dispensationalism. They follow an allegorical interpretation of the Old Testament. They know that the Old Testament is mostly about the Jewish nation. And they are trying to, trying to show that the church is in the Old Testament and so they allegorize it. But when they begin to allegorize it, they also begin to allegorize and, uh, and spiritualize central and important doctrines, doctrine of creation. If you begin to spiritualize the Bible, what about the first early chapters of Genesis? What about uh, passages about heaven and passages about hell and passages about judgment? These begin, to be, these, these begin to be spiritualized and allegorized. So Charles Ryrie says this, allegorical interpretation fosters modernism. As has been pointed out, it's almost impossible to find a premillennial liberal or modernist among Plymouth Brethren who are supposed to be the founders of modern literalism. Liberalism is un, practically unknown. On the other hand, the great body of modernistic Protestantism is avowedly amillennial. Thus, the allegorical method of amillennialism is a step towards modernism. When you begin to teach spiritual, spiritualizing scripture, when you spiritualize passages to say they mean something different than they say, then you're, you're, you're a step closer to spiritualize and important doctrines of the Old Testament. And then you begin to say, well, what about if we can spiritualize the Old Testament, what about spiritualizing the New Testament? And they begin to spiritualize the fact that the Bible, is it, is it true? Can we trust it? And pretty soon they don't trust the word of God and they don't hold to some of the central doctrines of the scriptures because they begin to spiritualize and allegorize scripture. One of the problems in dispensationalism, one of the great problems uh, is when people mix dispensations. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me, let me mention, there's a couple of, there are seven different dispensations. And I'm gonna just mention those, dispens those dispensations to you briefly. There's the dispensation of, of innocence with Adam and Eve. There's the dispensation of, uh, of human government under Noah. There's the dispensation of conscience. There's the dispensation of promise. The promise is given to Abraham. There's the dispensation of law. There's the dispensation of grace or the church. And there's the dispensation of the kingdom. We have seven different dispensations. But what happens if you mix those dispensations? What if you say, you're gonna take 
verses that apply to the kingdom age and bring them over into our age today. People do that, especially the charismatic movement. They take miraculous events in the kingdom age, great events of healing and power that come from the Lord Jesus, come from his throne. And they begin to apply those today, that, that miraculous element they apply today. And then some people, more of a reformed background, they take passages from the law. They take passages from the law and they bring them over, they bring them over to the church age. And they say, these are things that we need to practice. And so it's very dangerous when we mix dispensations, we need to keep them separate. Some Christians seem as they're living in the dispensation of law. They begin to practice a lot of the laws of the Old Testament. It's interesting to look at some denominations, some of the more Protestant in larger denominations, they've got synods and they have got religious lawmaking bodies. They've got ceremonial dress. They've got religious vestment. They have ceremonies. They've got ritual. They've got rules. They have laws. And all of this, all of this comes from the Old Testament. The Roman Catholic Church, we see so much of that. Their lawmaking bodies, their priesthood, uh, the Pope, uh, the dress the Pope has, the mitre on his head, the ceremonial dress, all of that comes from the Old Testament comes from the priesthood and the ceremony of the Old Testament. It's almost as if some, some denominations are living in the Old Testament and they've never come over in, into the age of grace. We have to be careful of this and you fall into that very easily. Sometimes they want to Christianize the world through religious laws and moral teaching. Instead of reaching out with the gospel they think about how can we use political systems, how can we influence through money and power uh, the laws of nations so we can Christianize nations. And this is, what, this is what state churches do, and that's why it's wrong. They're not using the gospel to transform the world. They're using religious laws and moral teaching and politics to do that. The Anglican Church and the Presbyterian Church and the Lutheran Church and the Catholic Church, they all are involved in this kind of thing. The dispensation of the kingdom, uh, miracles and acts of power, we hear more and more terms like kingdom living and kingdom authority. Uh, you hear sermons on that. And a lot of it has to do with how do we bring the kingdom down into our day and age? Uh, there's a there's a song. And it's not sung as it's not sung as much as it used to be, but uh, it's called Majesty. Majesty, worship His Majesty. Notice this: Kingdom authority flow down from His throne unto His own. His anthem ring. I'm sorry for the. His anthem ring, and um, we find Pentecostals and Charismatics. Uh, are very much involved in bringing the kingdom teaching over into the age of grace. The strengths of dispensationalism, uh, dispensational, uh, dispensationalism puts Christ in the first place. We've spoke about that already. Um, there's 500 references to Christ's second coming uh, in the Old Testament. And uh, these are very important to interpret properly. It invigorates missions and spiritual life of believers it stimulates Bible study. And uh, so dispensationalism is very, very important. Let's look at a couple of passages together. And uh, I want to make sure I don't go over my time. And uh, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9 and Genesis 9 verse 6. Let's take our Bibles and take a look at this for a minute. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9, <clears throat> this has to be, this, this has to do with Cain killing his brother Abel. And what happens in that dispensation is interesting. Chapter 4 of Genesis. God says to him, 
that people should not kill him. He will put a mark on him that when he goes and is a wanderer on the face of the earth, that he should not be killed. Now, this is the dispensation of conscience. He should not be killed. He should not, the, the, death, penalty, the death penalty should not be exercised at that point. Now turn to chapter 9 and verse 6. Chapter 9 and verse 6 of Genesis, now we're in a different dispensation. And in this dispensation, it's the dispensation of government. Now government is given the right to have laws. And one of those laws is capital punishment. Let me just read to you verse 6. Whosoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For he was made in the image, for in the image of God was he made, was made man. Now, let me say this, what will happen? You got a new believer, he's reading through the scriptures, reading through the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 4, he finds out that God said, do not, do not exercise the death penalty as far as the, the murder of Cain of his brother Abel. And you say, okay, that makes sense. Okay. Now you come to chapter 9, only five chapters later, and you find something totally different. You find here there should be the death penalty. If someone sheds someone's blood, there should be a death penalty. Now, we cannot understand Scripture unless we have a dispensational understanding of the Bible. These are two different dispensations. God is doing two different things in these dispensations. And so without, a, without rightly dividing, without rightly discerning between these dispensations, now could, uh, could those who lived in the dispensation previous, can they bring over from, from chapter 4 over to chapter 9? No, they can't do that. And they couldn't take what's in chapter 9, move it over to a previous generation. We, those are applied to that dispensation. And so we see this is very important. It's very important to understand the word of God. What about Matthew 10 and Matthew 28? Now, Matthew 10, just briefly, Matthew 10, it says in Matthew 10, as the Lord speaks to his disciples and he speaks to the 70, he says, go to all the villages and the cities of the Jews, the Jewish people preaching the gospel to them. And then he says this, do not go to any of the cities of the Gentiles. Don't go to any cities of the Gentiles at all. Chapter 10. You come to chapter 28. This is after the cross. What do you have? In chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, he says, go into all the world, go to all the nations. And the word for nations is Gentiles. Go to the Gentile nations. Whenever you see the word nations, it's, it's in opposition to the Jewish people. It means Gentiles. So here he says, make disciples of them. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So here in chapter 10, he says, don't go to the Gentiles. But in chapter 28, as you begin to have the church age, he says, go to the Gentiles. So without seeing a dispensational change, we cannot understand the word of God. So dispensationalism is very, very important. Well, our time is going, and uh, we want to look at a few more things. Let's look at the gospel. And I think this is crucial today, crucial. I find that, and, and I, I'm not saying our assembly is, is better than anywhere else. Uh, but I find churches and assemblies, and our assembly as well, probably your assembly as well too, we don't see men and women coming to Christ as, as we should. I find this is true in Baptist churches, in independent Bible churches. I talk to other people from other churches. I find the same thing. I find the gospel is not going forth in boldness. The gospel is not going forth in power. And I think this is a very important thing. And I think the gospel is being watered down. And this is one of the doctrines we need to defend. When we're defending the, 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 the faith, defending and guarding the gospel is very important. 
some evangelical statistics. 275 evangelical denominations in North America. Average age of an evangelical believer is 55 years old. About 40,000 students attend evangelical seminaries. About 11% of evangelical Christians read the Bible every day. 5% of evangelical Christians will lead an unsafe person to Christ in their lifetime. You know, we had a, a very wonderful thing happen. Two of our young teenage girls, they're uh, 17 or 18, two of them, they led uh, a young girl to the Lord. And she made a profession of salvation. That was wonderful. This was a wonderful thing. And I, I said to their father, I said, you know, some, some Christians don't lead anyone to the Lord in their whole lifetime. 90% of churches in the U.S. are 200 persons or less, 70% um, or 75 persons or less, and one researcher said there'll be 20,000 churches will close in the next 10 years. So there's a lot of serious, there's, there's serious problems, and uh, one of the things is the gospel needs to be preached and proclaimed. Let's think a little bit about the gospel. In 1950, there were about 375,000 churches. In 2015, about 250,000 churches in North America, evangelical churches, a third less. But in 1915, there were 500,000 churches. And in 2015, there's half, half of those. Now, many of those churches closed. They were in rural areas and population moved to the cities and they shut down because people moved out of these areas. But still, half of them closed and very few started again. Of those 250,000 churches that remain today, 80%, it is said, 200,000 are stagnant and declining. 4,000 churches close their doors every year. 3,500 people leave their churches every single day. Now, these are statistics from ministries that study uh, the local church and study what's happening in North America. Of the 46,000 Southern Baptist churches, 80% see zero to one baptized in the 12 to 29 year old age group. We usually don't baptize anyone until they're around 12 years old, uh, maybe 10 or 11. But a lot of them aren't baptized till they're 12 years old. But many times in, in certain churches, they're baptized at five years old and four years old. And, but here, the Southern Baptist Church's largest evangelical denomination in North America are seeing very, very few come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some would say, well, that's because culture has changed. That's because the world has changed so much. It's such a secular world, and it is. I'm not denying that. But I believe we can still reach unsafe people. And the Jehovah Witnesses are one example of this. This, this is, challenges me. This challenges me in my, in my thinking as a, as a Christian. In 1947, Jehovah Witnesses reached one million people. And the majority of Jehovah Witnesses are in North America. World, the, the, the percentage, the greater percentage of Jehovah Witnesses are in North America, 80%. Today, 2015, there are nearly 20 million. From 1947 to 2015, there are nearly 20 million. 80% of them are in North America. In the U.S., there's one Jehovah Witness for every 249 people. That's an amazing thing. Where our local assembly is on the on the on the same road, just down the road a little bit, is a Jehovah Witness Hall, and you can drive around and you'll see Jehovah Witness Kingdom Halls very frequently. They're all through the United States. Jehovah, this is what struck me. In research, Jehovah Witnesses hold nearly nine and a half million Bible studies every year, every month in North America. Nine and a half million. Well, you'll, if you have that many Bible studies, sometimes one-to-one, -one, sometimes it's just in a household with one or two people. Their reported growth 
is about 16%. Critics say it's about 2.2%. But that's higher than most any other denomination. Jehovah Witnesses are gaining numbers. Now, a lot of people leave Jehovah Witnesses. They don't keep numbers. But they're able to work hard and they see they see adherence to their religion because they're working very hard at having Bible studies. What about us? I don't want to pick on the Southern Baptists, but there was an article written about them. What, what is part of the reason? I, I see a, a real contrast between Southern Baptist churches and Jehovah Witnesses. Five reasons why most Southern Baptist churches baptize almost no millennials. They don't baptize people who are 12 years old through 29, mostly little children. Last year, 60% of 46,000 Southern Baptist churches reported no baptisms of the 12 to 17 year old. 60% of 46,000 churches, gospel preaching evangelical churches reported no youth baptisms in the 12 to 17 year old age. And 80% said one to zero baptisms among 18 to 29. One of, one of four Southern Baptist churches reported zero baptisms overall, no children at all. And the only consistently growing baptism group was under, under five years old. They're baptizing uh, children who are under five years old four years old or five or three, they're baptizing. Now this is, this is a problem. This was a denomination that at one time was very vigorous and aggressive in their evangelism. What are the reasons? What are the reasons? What are the five reasons why? Now, I don't have time to go through all of them. <coughs> Excuse me. But I want to look at this, the last one what's called celebration. Many of our churches have chosen to celebrate other things as a measure of success rather than new believers following Christ in baptism. We have drifted into a loss of expectation. We could translate that into saying, we just don't preach the gospel anymore. We don't preach it very much. Couple of, a couple of quotations, C.H. Spurgeon, where the gospel is fully and powerfully preached with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, our churches not only hold their own, but win converts, which constitutes our power. When the gospel is concealed and the life of prayer is slighted, then the whole thing is a form in fiction. I know a lot of assemblies don't see people saved. Some do. Uh, I'm not sure about Yonkers. I'm sure you see some saved and baptized. I, I'm happy to see a lot of different assemblies I, that, that I talk to. We see some of that. But there are a lot of them that are closing down. In our area, two of the eight have closed down in the last two years. And a couple of the other ones are quite small. We need to get back to preaching the gospel and prayer and reaching out and talking to our neighbors and having Bible studies and winning souls for the Lord Jesus Christ. H.A. Ironside, he wrote this when he was, uh, was with assemblies. He wrote this in 1939. And this is a challenge to me. Souls are harmed by an easygoing ministry that does not arouse the conscience which lets people complacently drift to a lost eternity. We had an experience just last, last Sunday. We have uh, a, 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 a believer, a sister, and she invited a woman to come to the chapel. And that woman, I would say, is a nominal Christian. She would say she's a Christian, but we're not sure about her salvation. But what's so interesting is that nominal lady invited a real unsaved lady last Sunday to come to the chapel. And there was a real strong gospel message that was given last Sunday. And that was so encouraging. 
That's such a good thing. Now, she wasn't saved yet, but she told her friend she's coming back. She heard something that challenged her heart. She wants to come, an unsaved lady wants to come back and hear more. The nominal Christian wants to come back. I think when we preach with conviction and we preach with power, we preach from the heart, uh, it, it has an effect on unsaved people. Ironside would say souls are harmed by an easygoing ministry that we are not preaching the gospel, we're not preaching about sin, we're not preaching. We're not preaching from the word of God. H.A. Ironside says this, let me give a word to those who seek to win souls. Do not rush people into, do not rush them into confessing Christ, but see if there's a real exercise about their sins. And so forth and so on. When there's divine conviction of sin, when they're awakened to see their need, then, then give the gospel to them. That's the divine order. Now, our I'm over time. I'm looking at my clock here. I've been, uh, I'm over time. And so I want to close in prayer. I want to close with this quotation and then I'll close in prayer. John Phillips says, the power to see God work in people's lives is inherent in the gospel. In the gospel resides power, mighty, irresistible power, power to open eyes and break chains. Our God and Father, we thank you for our time together. Father, we pray that you will lead and guide. Father, give us a heart from the gospel. Give us a heart to understand Scripture properly through dispensationalism. Father, help us defend Scripture, defend the great doctrines of the New Testament, great doctrines of the Bible. Give us a heart to stand and defend, stand and, and, uh, and speak out and teach the Word of God. So we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.